We said if we finished by one day. Thanks for being here. We'd be okay. Uh, we're delighted that you uh, decided to join us, have such a great crowd. Please continue to eat. Uh, but we do have some uh, some folks that are going to be sharing with you. So uh, make this le as leisurely as you can. We, we have plenty of time to eat and uh, still continue with the program. First of all, uh, the book that's in your chair is a is a gift from Donna Brockman. Her name is on the cover. Uh, some of you are wondering if there was going to be a quiz. No, there is not an end of course assessment on the book. It is simply for you to enjoy and share with uh, other educators who might uh, might have need of it or might enjoy it as well. Uh, also, it's important for me to point out. Obviously, we could not do such a nice event for you guys. Uh, superintendents without help from those folks who always help us and you've heard their names mentioned and we will continue to mention their names because that's such a small thing we can do for the great things they do for us at KSA and for you as well. Uh, Scholastic is the sponsor of this lunch and uh, some Scholastic folks are here with us and we want to recognize them and thank them. David Smith, Wanda Broom, and Kelly Campbell, would you three please stand and uh, let them know how much we appreciate uh, their support, David, thank you. You all saw David last night on the program. Uh, so uh, say thanks to them as you leave the room. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our MC for the day, the Reverend Most Holy Dr. Tommy yeah. Floyd. I think, was it, is that part of your title now? I don't know. Uh, but he's got a great panel of your colleagues up here, and uh, they have some things to share, and I know you'll appreciate uh, them spending their time doing this for you. So, Tommy, it is all yours. We are really excited to have you here today, superintendents. Have a group like this gathered in a room. I want to welcome you on everybody that's assembled. Talk to you about some things before we get started. Let me tell you why we're so excited to share what we're going to share today. Because today is a great example of a collaboration. A uh, collaboration between the Governor's Office of Early Childhood. Christian Motley and several other folks here today, uh, the Kentucky Department of Education, Children's Inc., uh, Pritchard, lots of, lots of partners. But what we have assembled today are four superintendents who volunteered to give their time to talk about how the early childhood efforts in their district is making a difference every day for kids. Why early childhood with as much as you have on your plate? Why in the world bring it up now? as you're well into planning for the 15-16 school year. Here's a couple reasons. Kindergarten readiness numbers for the last two years haven't moved very, very much. We're looking at about half of Kentucky's children not being ready for your school door as kindergartners. The Early Childhood Advisory Council has put today as a possibility on their radar long before because they said way back when superintendents and this is not aimed at your staff first, this is aimed at you. Superintendents needed some tools, talking points, first steps, and some examples like we have on our panel today. Early childhood is a part of the national and state discussions on education reform, especially public education, and debates. It will be a fundamental issue in the governor's race for Kentucky. All of you are spending Title I dollars, IDEA dollars, and of course, general fund dollars as soon as a group of kindergartners hits your door all the way through their graduation or when they leave your district. So that makes it pertinent to everybody in the room. No one needs to tell you that while many of you are doing some awesome work in closing gaps and moving kids, we all know that some students who arrive at the kindergarten door never catch up. And everything you do as a superintendent to help everybody be the best whatever they are they can be those gaps still remain. As you look at the available resources you have, we thought it'd be very, a, a very great time to introduce some information to you at the end of our session today. We are gonna actually introduce a toolkit that these folks have contributed to and lots of folks out there have put this together for Kentucky superintendents. To our knowledge, it's the only thing of its kind like it, and it, it is directly for you. So, first thing I'd like to do is start down at the end with Kathy. And I'd like for them to introduce themselves, just for the new folks, because we do have some new superintendents in the room. And I'd like everybody to introduce themselves and work your way back, who you are, what you, where you are. Hi, my name is Kathy Hall. I'm 
My name is Kathy Burkhardt. I'm the superintendent of the Erlinger Ellesmere Independent School District. And I'm Henry Webb. I'm superintendent in Floyd County Schools. I'm Rachel Yarbrough, the superintendent for the Webster County Schools. And I'm Nanette Johnston. I'm the superintendent for Hardin County Schools. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ask a series of questions. They're going to get the answer as they see fit. I think what's so unique about today, though, is these folks could easily be sitting among you, but instead they volunteered to share. Getting up in front of your peers, as you know, is something you put yourself, you put yourself out there. You do it every day. So we want to give you some examples. So here goes question number one, panel, and we'll let you all choose in any order because you get to do that. Where or why did you begin your early childhood focus? Why or where? We started because only 37% of our children are ready for kindergarten and we found out that only 50% of our students were attending any type of preschool program prior to kindergarten. So their first experience in school was kindergarten and uh, so we started there looking at our data and then pulled community partners in to share that data with them because many of them were not aware. And we're basically the same way. And additionally, we understand, like all of you do, that for us to get all of our kids to be college and career ready, that it starts before they even enter our doors. So we've really been uh, intensely focused over the last two years, especially, on uh, this initiative in our school district. You know, for Webster County, I think um, it's more of a question of, of why not? Instead of why focus on early childhood, I think the implications for a school district um, that does not pay close attention to what is happening with children in a community, birth to three, prior to pre-K, uh, makes no sense to me. I think you really, um, if, if you really are concerned about a high quality education, K through college career readiness, then um, you must ask yourself the question, what is happening in the world of children um, prior to their arrival into the Webster County um, schools? What's that experience like? What kinds of opportunities do those um, children have? You know, the Webster County Schools has, has a um, mantra that we are committed to uh, great opportunities for all kids. So all kids means all kids. And those kids may very uh, likely not be enrolled yet into the Webster County Schools. And so for me, it's more, um, it, it's, it's an essential part of how a school district must function if you really are concerned about uh, high quality education in a community and college career readiness. You cannot, you cannot leave early childhood out. And I came from a little bit different um, angle because for many years I was the one standing in front of the board as the director of early childhood in our district telling the board that there are very few guarantees in life but I could guarantee them that if they would increase services for uh, early childhood education, and at that point I was really advocating because uh, you know they hadn't hadn't opened up and, and increased the uh, number of children that could qualify, but I was seeing a real need in those children that come to us that don't speak English, and they don't qualify under preschool guidelines to come to preschool, yet we start and shoot ourselves in the foot. We start those kids in kindergarten, expect them to learn to read, and they don't even speak English. So I told our board there are many things that we could be doing that would be very minimal cost to our school district, and it would help children. And I could stand in front of them and guarantee that they would do far less remediation and far less money at the end of the spectrum if they would increase their services at the front end children were the ones that were helping do the intervention because they were in a language rich environment rather than hiring a lot of staff to pull kids one on one and do things we could fix up front so i have to keep my money where my mouth is now that i'm in the spot to make that difference so. as 
a brand new superintendent, and I didn't know most of you then. I was put on the early childhood advisory group by the governor because of some things we had going on in Madison County. I drove back from that meeting, and I, I, I really was almost nauseous as I realized how little I, my career had led me to understand early childhood and my personal awareness of what it took. But I heard two things. It's already been mentioned several times. I heard brain development by five years old. I also heard uh, there were a lot of kids that didn't go to preschool and a lot of kids that didn't go to Head Start in my county. And all of a sudden, I was responsible for them at five years old. A simple conversation with my preschool director, my elementary instructional supervisor, and an elementary principal or two, and I knew pretty quickly we had a whole lot of kids we couldn't account for that as exactly as three of these folks said, their first day of school or, or strategy implementation was at a kindergarten in my district. I had a lot of work to do, and I didn't have a clue where to start. But I, I knew hanging out with the early childhood advisory folks, I could learn quickly. And that's kind of what today's all about, is to give you that opportunity. So here comes the next question for the panel. How did you go about establishing partners for the work, and what kind of mindset as a superintendent is required for this type of collaboration. For us, it, it goes back to our mission and everything we do is tied to that. It's about embracing and attending to the individual needs of our students regardless of the obstacle. And we knew that kindergarten readiness was an obstacle. And if you're really about what you say you're about, you can't ignore it. And so we started working uh, with Children Inc. Um, they were able to work with us and we're piloting a program where they've given us an outreach person. That person uh, works with our school district and also has helped us to pull in all the early child care providers. We're working with them. We meet monthly and we share ideas. We share resources. Uh, we're planning together. Uh, with just that little bit of work, we've already doubled the number of children who are in Head Start and in our preschool and in our centers right now. So that was just from this year to now, and we know that's going to make a difference for our students, and we can't ignore uh, the readiness for our kindergartners. Well, the mindset's very simple from my perspective. It's all about our kids, and we've all got to be willing to work with our community partners to make sure that our kids are prepared when they enter kindergarten. Uh, and quite frankly, to get them through graduation to be college or career ready. So Tommy, I would say that we've reached out uh, to all of our daycare centers, our, our, uh, uh, our community as a whole, and we just had the mindset that we're all in this together. And at the end of the day, uh, if kids are prepared when they come through our doors in kindergarten, as has been mentioned, we're gonna spend less time remediating those kids. And the research is very clear the opportunity for those kids to be successful and to be college career ready go up astronomically. And we've had great feedback from our community and we've done a lot of different things to get them involved. Uh, but we've had great feedback about the work, great partnerships, and everybody's really pulling together to try to make sure all of our kids have high quality experiences before they come through our doors. Because like many of the panelists here, like many of you, so many of our kids don't have the support at home. And that's been critical for us to move our district forward for our kids. You know, I think for us, um, what in a rural community um, that Webster County serves, um, there are limited organizations um, that that exist that you can draw from. Like perhaps you can if you're in more of an urban area um, that have uh, kind of a parallel mission for um, you know the health and wellness of a community, and so. In a rural, rural community, um, I think you really have to, there's an early childhood council that, that exists in most um, communities right now. And to what extent do they have an impact is, is, is a great question to ask. But I think the school districts, from my perspective, have uh, taken that role very seriously of what is happening, kindergarten through um, 12th grade. That's where our focus has been. Uh, we've had a preschool, either either uh, partnered with Head Start or blended program, and we have touted that. That's the low-hanging fruit. So the tough part becomes how does how does the leadership of a school create stronger conversations, better partnerships? 
um, with community um, folks, how do you look at the data around around children who who are not involved in any type of um, early childhood program at all? They're, they come uh, from homes. They have been in a daycare. What's the quality of that daycare? What does that look like? How many of those um, are? What kinds of opportunities? And in Webster County, right now there is one, one daycare. There used to be three. So when when we talk about what's happening for kids, if the school district doesn't begin to own the push toward creating conversations, um, strengthening opportunities for children at an earlier age, it, it won't happen. If, if the school district and the superintendent and the early, or the early childhood coordinator or the director of special education, preschool coordinator, um, if family resource folks, if those individuals do not rally behind early childhood in rural communities, um, it, it, it's just not happening like it could. And I'm certainly learning more about um, how, to be, how to be the catalyst um, for trying to bring more of those partners and create opportunities within the school district um, to, to educate and, and create quality opportunities for children birth to three. Um, and so uh, I just think it has to be a shift. It has to be a shift in our thinking as uh, K through 12 public educators. Mindset wise, um, really, I, I have been in hundreds, I guess, hundreds of IEP meetings and really see what I would call a miracle happen with, a, uh, with children and what happened in those years of, of preschool. Um, that they would never have made it honestly and as a superintendent now to watch them walk across the graduation stage and know really know firsthand how several of those kids started <clears throat> makes me makes me really yearn for that same opportunity for all of our kids what we had happen is we saw um, when I first came in as superintendent I was um, voluntold I guess to be part of uh, United Way. That was the really one of the best things, one thing that really kind of launched the partnership. I also got to be the chair of the fundraising <clears throat> effort that year. We raised over a million dollars and the emphasis was on Smart Start and focusing on early childhood and at that point United Way has really embraced the fact of uh, trying to see what we can do to um, eliminate poverty and help kids get a, a better start. We can't do it by ourselves as a school district. We're going to be chasing our tail. So we have to look outside of our doors at our, our community partners, and, and, and it does take a village, to see who's out there that also has that same passion. United Way, hospitals, because every child in our region is born at Hardin Memorial Hospital, so how can we get our hospital involved and our doctors involved because they're seeing those children before we ever see those children. Our community foundation. So uh, we built relationships with those folks. They got the same passion. So when we went to them with a map of showing, um, looking at our county and the readiness level, which was at about 50%, but some pockets of our county were below 30%. And we had to ask the question, why? It wasn't in, because of a daycare. They weren't going to a daycare. They didn't, a family background was they didn't need to have a daycare. They were taking care of things at home. So we had to go to our partners and say, so how can we go to them? And so it got to be very much the same thing we do in the school as targeted intervention for our kids that we know are um, not where they need to be. How are we going to get to the kids that are not ready? Because they're they're never going to catch up when they're that far behind. So um, that's uh, we 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 reached out to our partners in that way. I remember pulling the yellow pages out of the desk, and I looked for daycare, childcare, and we made a list. And I remember creating a little letter to these people that I didn't know, and 
my administrative assistant took care of what she needed to take care of with my crafted letter, and we put it in the mail. And we asked a simple question like, dear community partner, we would like to know if you're interested in getting together over a cup of coffee to talk about early childhood in Madison County Schools. Or, no, I did not say schools, because I was coached not to say schools. I said Madison County. Because I didn't want to think the big school system was coming in to tell them how to run their business, because that's not what they needed to hear. So I didn't know what to expect. And not everybody answered our letter, but a whole lot of them did. We had 16 daycares show up for the first meeting. And they were worried about, what, what, what's this really about? And I remember I almost had that hat in my hand approach, and I said, look, we didn't come here today with answers, but here's what we know. We know that a lot of our kids are in your facilities before they ever get to, to a kindergarten door because they don't qualify for preschool, they don't qualify for Head Start. All we're asking is, how can we work together on turf, blame, and credit to get more kids ready for kindergarten? And three meetings later, there were 60-some people in the room Nobody throwing rocks. Uh, nobody mad. Uh, yeah, a whole lot of the people that were still in the room were making great money. They had successful child cares in, in our county. They didn't need us. And that's the point. A whole lot of them don't need us to, to stay in business. Some of them will. But, but what happened then was a partnership. And we were very careful not to make it about Madison County Schools, but about making it, we call it the Madison County Early Childhood Alliance. Everybody got a banner. We, we took out an ad in the newspaper. It began to be something. And we, then we started training ch uh, child care workers on Saturday. Who did that? Preschool, kindergarten, Head Start teachers in Madison County. They loved it. People from other counties started coming. It, it was all of a sudden a new focus. And I was completely out of the way. Of course, where I deserve to be. And, and, and all I did was get the ball rolling. And then I kept asking districts people, you know, where are we on this? Where are we on that? When I had direct reports with, with district staff, I made sure that was included. So, uh, it can start really simple. Uh, it, it did in Madison. Third question. Everybody on this panel, I'm going to let them do the rest of the talk. What specific programs do you want to highlight for superintendents here today in your district with a focus on early childhood that you have taken some ownership in, you've seen develop just one big idea that you could share with the tables? One thing uh, we've developed is the early, Erlinger Ellesmere Early Childhood Community Collaborative, which is similar to what you discussed, uh, where we do come together, share ideas, share resources, do training together, and every one of the child care centers uh, in our district attends. And what I found is that it's about building relationships. Not only them, but with Head Start. We went door to door with Head Start to recruit, recruit kids. And so many times in education, we want to talk about what we're doing in our district but we don't always listen to what the needs are in the community. And so we found that they had similar needs uh, with the students that were even enrolling. And I hear early child care providers saying, oh, these one-year-olds, they're so far behind. And so really looking at sharing uh, resources and ideas in that way. And then one other thing is we've tried to really share the same information everywhere. So wherever we are, we talk about early childhood. We've connected that to everything we're doing. In the toolkit, one powerful slide uh, that is in there that has been the most useful to me was provided by Children Inc. There's a um, slide that shows a child's brain, uh, a PET scan of a child's brain, when they have uh, received the type of language activities and uh, they've been read to and talked to and their brain is developed uh, the way we would like it to be when they enter kindergarten. And physically, the brain is different. So you can talk about numbers all day long, but if you, you can show people a picture of that brain versus there's another slide, another picture of a brain of a child who's been deprived. Parts of that brain are physically different and are not even lit up. And that speaks to everyone. When you show that to everyone, they want to listen, they want to help, they want to be a part of what you're doing. And it is all about making sure that it's something that's not about the school district, as Dr. Floyd said, but something about this, uh, 
this moral thing that we all need to be doing to ensure that every child, no matter who they are or where they come from, has the opportunity. We've focused so much on college and career readiness. We've gone to that end of the pipeline and beyond. What about the beginning? We need to extend what we're doing if we're really going to make a difference for all children everywhere. And so those resources, just the relationships, um, that we've been developed, uh, that have been developed with those people and listening to what they're doing. I had no idea of the things that were going on with 4C, with uh, the requirements of early child care providers and what the hoops they have to jump through and how hard it is for them to even be trained to become high quality. So we're actually, as a school district, working with them to help them become high quality because that helps us and we don't have all the answers, but it's all about listening and sharing the responsibility. And it is exciting to see daycare folks and people in the community coming to trainings and everybody engaged in a professional learning community working for kids. Uh, but what I want to share is uh, we have the Born Learning Academy, as many do, uh, and I know that's my understanding they're expanding that. But what I really want to brag on is our board. Our board has uh, significantly increase the funds in that program. We're not just dependent on the grant. So year one, a couple of years ago, we was having 10, 15 parents and kids showing up a meeting. Well, now we've tripled that and, and we've got goals set. Um, to have those parents and students come in and have training, fun activities on a regular basis, if you do not have that going on in your school district, I would encourage you, even without the grant, uh, as Nanette said earlier, that doesn't take a lot of money. That's something you can get started right away. And to see those activities going on and parents working with kids in settings, and it's, it's parents from uh, low-income families, and it's also parents from high-income families. I mean, we've got lots of people coming on a regular basis working with fun activities to help better prepare their kids for kindergarten. It's been a tremendous uh, asset to our district, and it's been something that I know the kids are going to benefit from as they enter kindergarten. That's one thing that I would encourage you to give some serious thought about going forward, even without the grant. Uh, there are a few things that are happening um, in Webster County Schools, and basically it's, it was from a contract meeting with um, Audubon Area Head Start. You, know, you have those annual meetings, and you talk about transportation, and you talk about services, and, and it, it really um, had to do with listening. And, and, a, and just that open comment from the school district side around, we are wide open for any opportunity that we may not even know exist on behalf of um, Early Head Start. And, and so the folks from Audubon um, Area Head Start had just received a grant and there were some districts that had not used all their slots. So at the end of that meeting, uh, Webster County Schools will be launching in 15-16 what we are calling the Alpha, an Alpha Academy at two schools. Alpha, we create great beginnings for kids. Um, and so there will be two classrooms for birth to three-year-olds in two schools um, that are highest poverty schools in Webster County. At one of those schools, we're going to be able to offer a three- to five-year-old full day, full year uh, wraparound opportunity that currently does not exist for uh, Webster County um, kids at the moment. We had the space, they had the slots, and it was a matter of not just having that contract conversation the same old way that you that you do, but you you really think about how can we strengthen this partnership and you would be amazed at what those possibilities are from organizations like Head Start when, when, when they realize that you really are willing to create space, uh, eliminate some barriers. And so we're really excited about that. We also had some serious conversations with our family resource um, coordinators and their role and function in our school districts during the summer. What do you do? And so we have created a family resource family outreach really targeting three-year-olds, four-year-olds. We've had them contact vacation Bible schools and who came for the classes um, in those early um, childhood, um, um, you know, just, just anything that was happening in a community connected to young, young children. And we also, one more strategy that Children's Inc., um, Rick 
I learned from him uh, sitting on that uh, Governor's Early Childhood Council. I learned, you know, how much you know you don't know is what I found out. Uh, but, but one idea was that in, in Webster County Schools right now, we have one common strategy that we share with everybody. That's what Kathy said a few minutes ago. We do a shared reading strategy. It's six steps. Our family resource people, we, we train that in the schools. We, we're going we're gonna to train um, high school kids who, who uh, you know, have younger siblings. We're going to use that when we have back to school events. One strategy that's effective with kids that parents can learn how to use. So we're not giving people 15 things to wrap their head around. We're all communicating this one message so that, um, you know, it can just become infused into the community and we know that, it's a re that it works. And so um, I think those are a few things that are happening in Webster County schools that uh, we're really excited about on behalf of early childhood. The first thing I would say, um, and this, this would take grant money to do this, but it's been very beneficial. We, we also had the Born Learning Academy in, in a couple of different places in our county that was extremely beneficial. We also have used the child nutrition program during the summer, the summer feeding program. You already have an, an opportunity where people are coming into your facility. So from 11 to 1, we work with our community foundation and they are funding what's called a get ready camp. So from 11 to 1, we have preschool teachers there. It's for children birth to five in our very high poverty areas to where those families can't really afford the meal. Uh, of course, the children eat free, but the, fa the parents don't. We pay for the meal for the parents, and we provide transportation with, with family resource to try to get them there, to try to overcome some of those barriers. Uh, so we provide Get Ready Camp in the summer. A component of that also is a partnership with our daycares and those uh, preschool teachers after they finish working directly with the children at the site where the lunch is served, they go out into the daycares and they do some science camps and math camps out in the daycares kind of as special guests that are going out into the, to that. So that builds that relationship and partnership there with them. Uh, during the school year, we have received a grant from United Way and they help fund a Parents as Teachers program that goes through our Family Resource Centers. So we do cradle school. So Friday, when we don't have preschool and our preschool teachers are out doing home visits and in the home, their classroom is used for cradle class where we bring in families birth to five and they come and uh, they have interactive parent-child time they do field trips, reading, they go to the library, a lot of different activities. It's very, very beneficial. Um, also, uh, something you could look at if you're not doing this is looking at your title funds. We have, when we do our screening, our dial screening, you have that level of children that they don't qualify. Those are the children that kind of fall in that gray area, but you know they're going to start and they're going to start behind in kindergarten. That, that's the first line of children that we bring into a readiness class that is funded through Title I because they're not served through preschool funds. And it's right there in the, in the school with the preschool classroom, so they do a lot of things together, same curriculum, all aligned with the early childhood standards. That's been very beneficial as well. We look at every open slot that we have anywhere and try to fill that slot with a child that falls in that gray area and also especially those children that are non-English speaking. We try to get those children in because they cannot qualify by delay if they're, if they're English as a second language child, only if it's by income. So we try to get those children in as well. Uh, what we're going to try to do in the coming year is um, we're looking at opportunities, um, especially with space as an issue, especially for some of you, to where we actually can employ a teacher to go out and go into some of the daycares and do some of the things we're doing in the summer, but do that during the year and, and work with that staff and do interventions and collaboration. And not, we're not trying to take any children from the daycare. We're trying to be another resource for that daycare, either 
through consultation or working directly with children. And also we have a school that's uh, getting ready to move to a brand new school. So we have a, actually a building that's going not to be occupied in elementary school. So we're looking with our community college. We already have Head Start that's going to lease part of that building. So we're trying to expand and get some partnerships with our community college and do uh, more lab school kind of settings and serve some unserved children, especially in the birth to three, we do not have an early head start. And if you can get anything like an early head start, that makes a tremendous difference, birth to three. So everybody in the room kind of has to decide how you look at this work, how you would approach this work, if you would approach this work. And we knew that. So what do we, what do we really hear from our panel today? It's going to require a cooperative mindset, maybe with some folks you've never partnered with before. Maybe you're already doing a whole lot. Maybe these partnerships that you already have in place can lead to more. Every one of you have limited resources. The people in this room don't need to be told as to that fact about limited resources. How about using resources that are available to leverage partnerships that give more, for the, more bang for the buck? This year will definitely be a year that superintendents and, and folks start looking at how to reduce novices, simply how that's going to unfold in the accountability system. I don't think you need that at all. I think that's important. But I think this is about more kids not being in that novice category, more kids being ready uh, to graduate college and career ready. Henry said it. Rachel said it. C uh, Kathy said it. Annette said it. Many of you say it. A direct link between kindergarten readiness and college career readiness. Go look at your, your uh, K prep scores and, and look at your kindergarten readiness and some of your data. How can you use some of these partnerships as evidence for superintendent evaluation with your board? Make sure that your board understands you recognize the link between early childhood and, and college career readiness and graduation rate. The urgency piece is huge because what we know, standard six, thank you, Nanette, what we know is whether or not you're carrying the water or not. It's when one of you says to your staff, this is important work, and it's going to be a part of our district approach to get after it for our kids. It's going to become a priority. And pretty soon your people are going to start, start talking about it when you're not there. So what in the world would we do to help you with that? That's why it's so important today for us, and we're so excited. Thanks to all the people I mentioned earlier that put this together. Christian Motley's here. Christian, please stand up. Christian's taking the lion's share. Christian works for the Governor's Office of Early Childhood, and several of the staff folks are here. But superintendents and people at KDE and lots of people that contribute to what you're going to find. In tomorrow's Fast Five on Friday email, this link will be there for you to go to. And we'll repeat that for a while. And when we have a, another superintendent webcast, I hope we include that in, in that you'll have questions by then. I know these four people have brought contact information, cards and so on, to hand out to any of you. If you heard something that sounds similar to what you'd want to do, they would be glad to give you a card and then a follow-up discussion because of the time we have today. So let's look real quick at our toolkit and talk about how it's arranged. Notice it says superintendent toolkit. Again, because when the superintendent says, hey, this is what we're going to be about, this is what we're going to add as, as another focus to our work. This is a collaboration. Um, it talks about, if you look at the upper left-hand corner, it's a lot like Superintendent PGS and other websites we put out. Why do the early years matter? As Kathy said, if you look at that brain, that stimulated brain, and you look at that picture of the unstimulated brain, even Tommy Floyd can understand, which brain do I want sitting in my kindergarten classroom? I know which one I want. And I want to do what I can to get more of those brains in my classroom. Uh, next. How does my community compare? Not trying to be anything other than illuminating where your county may be. Tommy didn't know he had an early childhood council. I didn't know what an early childhood council was until I went to that advisory meeting, and Rick made me understand that. So I found them, and I went to my first meeting, and you know what they said? Why are you here? And they may say the same when you show up if you haven't already. Who can I partner with? You've already heard examples. What about the county that doesn't have any licensed daycares? What about a county that has a whole lot? And how about somewhere in between? And how about my churches? And how about my public buildings and places where folks gather? Do I have a hospital? And if I have a hospital, how can I use my, my family resource center, youth service center folks, and my, and my home visitation folks to make a difference? Next, where do I begin? First steps. So you've done nothing in early childhood. Welcome to the club. But then when you take that first step, what are some examples out there that you can go with? 
And then lastly, who's doing it well? Now here, I'm looking at a room full of the most important people in this state. Who's already doing it well? You've got something going on in your district? You're proud of it? I, 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 saw, I saw a video. I've seen videos from all these people on my left. They've got little things they can, they can stick up there that you could watch in just a few minutes, and you could replicate it if you so chose. But I know that I, I, Rachel's was the most recent I just viewed. Three minutes of my time, four minutes of my time, and I had an idea that I never thought of before. And that's what we're looking for out of superintendents. No one's suggesting you're not already doing some of this work. But just like everything else, if we all get on the same page, and, and someone else looks a lot like me, how can I make my district stuff like their district stuff if they're doing something about gap, if they're doing something about readiness, and, and all I have to do as superintendent is kind of nudge the ball up the hill. And isn't that what we do anyway, is nudge that ball up that hill, that heavy ball? Um, we're really looking for some of you to help us with some best practice examples. So Christian is your contact person for the toolkit. I know in tomorrow's Fast Five, his email is going to be listed at the bottom. And all we're asking you to do, superintendents, if you want to know more, if you want to share, contact Christian, contact one of these superintendents. I know you know who they are because of what they do and how they do it. So, um, how about joining me and thanking our panel of superintendents today? And if you go to the toolkit and you stick your toe in the water and you feel pretty good about it, let me tell you what's coming up. There is going to be an early childhood fall summit for you and people you want to bring with you. And even if you've done not, just almost nothing as, the, as a district, as a, as a targeted uh, effort, come to the early childhood fall summit and you'll hear a lot more. And then you can network with people that have district demographics just like yours and let's, let's attack this thing holistically. So um, really, really appreciate your time today and your attention. You guys can make all the difference in the world. I want to thank Rick Hulefeld and the people in the Governor's Office of Early Childhood and everybody that had anything to do with this. But mostly we want to thank you because I know your kids are important. Uh, but we can't wait until they're in kindergarten. We just cannot. So I want to thank everybody. Um, wanted, to give, wanted to give you plenty of time to get to the next session. I know these folks will hang around if you want to pick up a card. Enjoy the rest of your conference. Awesome. Thank you.